Praise the Lord, I'm more than a conqueror. Yeah, the prophetic focus have been declared as seasons of glory. That's Isaiah chapter 1, chapter 61, 1 to 8. It began by saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And that is the testimony of every redeemed of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And because of this, certain things will begin to happen in my life. Praise the Lord. Can you say, I've entered my seasons of glory? Someone is not saying it. Someone doesn't believe it. Say it if you believe it. Declare it with boldness. Does it mean anything to you? Can you envisage that? You know what seasons of glory means. There are seasons in life. There are seasons of suffering. Seasons of dryness. But when you enter seasons of glory, you live literally under an open heaven. Almost everything you touch, in fact, not almost, everything you touch turns out amazing, beautiful. When you enter into your seasons of glory, ashes become beauty. He exchanges the spirit of mourning for garment of praise and the oil of joy. He makes you a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. He comforts all kinds of things that are in mourning. He makes you a repairer of bridges, of waste places. Once you enter your seasons of glory, you become unstoppable. You gain speed, you gain momentum. Things don't become hard for you anymore. People give, continue to wonder, why are things the way they are for this man? You look like a strange man on earth. Praise the Lord. Because it will always take the spirit of glory for you to enter into the seasons of glory and remain there. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He brings vengeance upon all that gather against you. As opposition is arising, they are squashed. They are subdued. He fights battles, invisible battles you don't know about. Can you say, I've entered my seasons of glory? Once you enter your seasons of glory, suffering becomes a thing of the past. You enter jubilee. Our teaching series for this month is understanding the blessedness of a revival. Understanding the blessedness of a revival. Joel chapter 2 from verse 21. Joel chapter 2 from verse 21 to 29. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Whenever there is revival, joy is inevitable. For the Lord will do great things. Not my, my things, minor things. Be not afraid. In case it says witches are having conference in your house. Ye peace of the field, for the pasture of the wilderness do spring. Even in wilderness where there is dryness, once there is revival, even things begin to happen in a place where that is concluded to be a wilderness. For the tree is bearing a fruit, the fig tree, the vine, do you their strength. Verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he had given you the former rain moderately. Can you say amen? amen? But he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That's the revival. And when the rain begins to fall, the floor shall be full of wheat. That's abundance. Revival brings abundance into your life. Abundance of goodness, abundance of glory, abundance of revelation, abundance of peace, abundance of joy, abundance of finances, everything. Because our God is a God of abundance. 
Everything God created, he created in abundance. The stars are in abundance. The planets are in abundance. The fishes are in abundance. Even bacteria are in abundance. Not one single thing God created that is not in abundance. Praise the Lord. He said, the floor shall be full of wheat and the fat shall overflow. Revival brings overflow. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over. And where there is overflow, there is no scarcity. When there is an overflow, you begin to meet the needs of others. Once you step into revival, you are no longer a needy, but a meter of needs. In case you are still so much needy, you have not entered the fullness of the revival that God has ordained for this prophetic season. In verse 25, he said, I will restore. Revival brings restoration of years of suffering, years of lust, years of waste. Verse 26. He said, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Revival brings satisfaction such that you look around, you don't see need, you don't see want. All you see is excess. And praise the name of the Lord, your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. When you are revival, shame and reproach is forbidden. Verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of thee. In a revival, divine presence is apparent. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And again he said, and my people shall never be ashamed. Can you say, my days of shame are over. You will never suffer shame again. In the name of Jesus. Jesus is able to take care of you such that he takes away all your reproaches, all your shames. He has taken my sorrows away. He has taken my sorrows away. Hallelujah, Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus is Lord. What is a revival? A revival is a move of the spirit of God. Just like in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible said in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And in verse 2, it said the earth was without form and void and there was darkness everywhere. But something was happening. The spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the deep. A move of the spirit in a person's life, in a ministry, in a family. And once the Holy Ghost is moving, things don't remain the same. In fact, revival comes from the Latin word vive, vive, v i v e. Okay, in uh, French. Life is called la vive. And it's from the same root word. Revive means to bring back to life. To restore life. And there are different degrees of life. Sometimes medically they can change, check how much alive you are by checking your blood, blood count, blood pressure. They examine your blood to know the components and if there are things there. And they can tell how much alive, if you are quarter to die, or if you have life full in you. As blood is to the human system, such that blood, as long as blood is flowing, all the vital organs are being supplied with all the need to function maximally so that you remain alive. That is how it is with creation. The spirit of the Lord is a life in creation. Darkness was everywhere. Everything was void, shapeless, formless. But as the spirit of the Lord began to move, there was a, an awakening, a stirring up. Whenever the spirit of God is moving, whatsoever has been dead or is dying or is about to die comes back to life. And the evidence of life is movement, progress, reproductivity, 
creativity. Whenever a human being is alive, new cells are created. Whenever a human being is alive, there is constant, continuous movement of materials within him. When movement is limited, all you can think about is debt. So every time cash is not flowing in an economy, the economy is dying. A business that does not have constant inflow and outflow is dying. So in a revival, the spirit of the Lord moves in a business, in a family, in a destiny, in a career to move that destiny forward. Revival brings progress. Revival brings prosperity in order to move you forward. To move the church forward. So that the nations can be affected. What South Africa needs is revival in the church. And once there is a dimension of revival in the church, men and women of wealth who will affect the economy will arise. Because in that Isaiah chapter 61, he said they shall build the old waste. Old waste. COVID have done so much harm to the economy of nations. And God is waiting for his stars. His generals. People who know the ways of the Lord. Who understand the movements of the spirit of God. God wants to empower people in order to make impact in society, impact in the nation. And they are one of such. When you are in a revival, the spirit of the Lord moves in your life and that makes you creative. Because one dimension, inevitable dimension of the spirit of the Lord is creativity. You create jobs, you create wealth, you create opportunities. Even in the midst of chaos, pandemonium, you create peace. The spirit of the Lord moved in Genesis chapter 1. And then the Lord said, let there be light. And every other thing began to manifest. You see, what you need in your life, for your life to take shape and form, is a revival. Revival can be personal. Revival can be congregational. Revival can be national. Revival can be regional. Because the spirit of the Lord moves in dimensions, in degrees. I once heard God's servant say that the quality of any ministry depends on the intensity of his presence. And by his presence, we mean the move of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Ghost is not moving you, your life will waste. Your life on earth will not waste. And to maximize the benefits of revival, you need to remain awake. That means you need an awakening. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, it said, Awake thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. In fact, revival is also an awakening. When the Holy Ghost moves to awaken you, that means your spirit. If your spirit is lousy, sleepy, dull, he moves to stir up your spirit and you become more sensitive and conscious about your spiritual nature, your spiritual life about the need of God, the role of God in your life. Revival is an awakening. Awakening means an awareness. You become more aware of the presence of God, of the hand of God, of the power of God, of the promises of God, of the prophecies in scripture. Awareness. Many have heard so many things, but they are not aware. Many have heard that man is a spirit, but they are not aware that they are spirits. They live like they are just human. They are just flesh and blood. They spend all the days of their life taking care of the body. All their plans is for this. 
All the entertainment is just concerning the body, nothing else. But revival is an awakening. It increases the level of your consciousness. To know that you are not just flesh and blood. It makes you more conscious of God in the midst of his people. So the Lord in the midst of his people is mighty. Once you are awakened and you become more God conscious, you will desire and long for God more. Just like in Psalm 27 verse 4. It's the one thing I desire of the Lord and that will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In a revival, men's heart begin to pant after God. After his kingdom. After the advancement of his kingdom. After the things of his kingdom. You hunger. When you become conscious, material things don't satisfy you. You are not just satisfied with having money, having house, having car, having house, having children, having wife. You know that life is much more than that. You truly want to serve God. You want to make impact. You want to touch lives. You want to be a blessing. If all that you live for is having money, acquiring possessions, you are still dull in your spirit. Church is not just all about acquiring possessions. Luke chapter 12 verse 15 says, take heed, beware of covetousness. Life is not all about positions and possessions. It's not all about I'm a governor and I have two jets. Life is beyond that. That is the elementary part of life, the elementary things of life. It's beyond that. Beyond that. Because all material things are to take care of this body. But an awakening makes you conscious of the fact that there is something eternal in you that did not begin on, from this earth. That we outlive this earth. That we continue to exist even a thousand years, a million years. And then you choose wisely. Revival will always tear the heart of men to choose the fear of God as a lifestyle, a new way of life. The fear of God becomes a new way of life. You just want to please God. It becomes your passion, your desire. Not just to please men, to impress men. Just like Bishop David Edible. You see, always on white suits and uh, red tie. <laughs> Praise God. As far as fashion is concerned, he doesn't have time to please anybody. There's nothing wrong with making people happy. But your primary goal in life is first and foremost to please God and God alone. What is a revival? A revival is a platform for divine visitation. Leading to the transformation of destinies and lives is a platform. And it is your responsibility as an individual to build that platform for Jehovah in your life. It is our responsibility as a church to raise a platform for the move of God so that we can say, The Lord in the midst of us. Is mighty. That is Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. Mighty to save. He will save. He will joy over us. We sing him. And that is what church is all about. Raising a platform for the move of God. A platform for divine visitation. Such that the nations are drafted into the kingdom. Whenever there is a revival, there is a mighty drafting in of the multitudes into the kingdom of God. After the order of Micah chapter 4 verse 1 to 2 it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted above the hills and established upon the mountains and the nations shall flow into it such that the house of the Lord becomes a solution center. That Matthew chapter 11 28 to 29 is practically fulfilled. Come unto me all ye that labor and the heavy laden and I will give you rest. In a revival, people come to church so that their bodies are lifted. Their lives are transformed. 
Their diseases are healed. Yokes are broken. The broken hearted are bowed. Prison gates are open. It is our responsibility in our homes, in our home cells, to provide this platform. That is what church is all about. If church is not a platform for divine visitation, it is simply a religious gathering. No more, no less. In 2 Corinthians, sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Ephesians chapter 2, it said, In whom all the building, fitly framed together, grew yet unto a holy temple in the Lord. He said, in whom ye also are builded together. Can you say we are builded together? For an habitation of God through the Spirit. The church is ordained to be a habitation of God. Dwelling place of God. A platform from where God operates to reach out to the lost, to reach out to the captive, to reach out to the nations. To transform society. Because the Bible said, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. He said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. He said, The Lord shall send forth the rod of his strength out of Zion. Out of Zion. Shall go for the law. He told Abraham, all nations of the earth shall be blessed by thee. And the platform through which God wants to bless the nations, to heal the nations, to affect the nations, is the church. And this is why every living church must be in a revival. And you as a person, it is your responsibility to provide this platform in your life that God makes you a vessel of honor through which to touch lives. Once you are in a revival, you are conscious of what you carry. Revival is an awakening. You are conscious. Like Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. <coughs> it said, Wherefore, I am reminding you, you knew it before, Paul was telling Timothy, I'm reminding you that you stir up the gift of God. That's the spirit of God in you. When you are in a revival, you are conscious that you carry something that is bigger than South Africa. I'm reminding you to stir up something that is in you. The gift of God which is indeed by the laying on of my hand. It means to fan into flame. They say, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. When you are in a revival, you fear no evil. But the spirit of power, the spirit in me is the spirit of power. Power to cause changes in my life, in my environment, in my location, and in society. You see yourself as an agent of change. A law enforcement agent of Jehovah. The spirit of love. Once you are conscious of what you carry and know how to stir it up, power flows through you naturally. Love flows through you naturally. The spirit of a sound mind. Wisdom flows through you effortlessly. Because it's there. And you have to stir it up. How do you stir it up? By prayer, devotion, consecration. I challenge you. This month, all throughout this month, spend minimum 30 minutes praying in tongues. Every day. Non-stop. Or one hour every day. And just see what difference it will make in your life. Just try it. Just try it. Consistently. I'm not saying one hour. Just 30 minutes. Consistently every day. Maintain it as a prayer order. If you go to one hour, okay. Two hours, okay. You just discover that the atmosphere around your life, around your business, does changes. 
things shift in the realm of the spirit. And if you have been praying one hour, extend it to two hours and see what happens around you. Once you are in a revival, your spirit is knit together with the spirit of the Lord. After the order of First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, it said, We that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And you know that you know that you know that you can't fail. And you know that you know that you know that you can't be stranded. And you know that you know that you know that you cannot want. You can't be in poverty. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. One spirit. And God manifests divinity through you. What is there for me in a revival? What is a revival for me? What are the things I will gain? Number one, revival is a spiritual launching pad to our high places in life. No Christian is called to live an ordinary life. But if you don't discover your identity, if you don't recognize what you carry, you can live an ordinary life. He said, for I said you are God's. But if you don't know, you don't understand, you will be out of course and die like men. The potentials you carry, that thing inside of you, can change your world and your environment if you know how to stir it up. To fan it into flame and let it glow and let it grow and let it explode. And then you can release different dimensions of divinity in your life. It's a launching pad to take you to your height. You keep rising. It lifts you up from where you are. Just like he said, he leaves a beggar from the dungeon and makes him to sit with the princes of his people. If it's money, you know where to get it. You know how to get it. If it's warfare, you know how to fight it. You know how to deal with your enemies. If it's doors, you know how to open it. Because you are in partnership with the same spirit that created the universe. That created the world. The devil would not know how to handle you anymore. Praise the Lord. Secondly, what is there for me in a revival? It brings about restoration of the redemptive dignity of a believer. That means shame, reproach is taken away. You live a life of honor. People respect you everywhere you go. They recognize you carry something. They recognize you are a person of substance after the order of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What more? Number three, speedy answers to prayers. Easy access to the ears of God. Speedy answers to prayers. You can stir yourself up to a level of revival such that before you ask, he answers. While you are here speaking, he hears. And not just that, you become a commander on it. Like it was said concerning Jesus. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. Hear him. When you speak nature, events, situation, circumstances, listen to you. A revival is a platform for living in a world of open doors. Because... It will always take the presence of the Lord to experience open doors. Now, what do we mean by open doors? Now, you can only talk of doors where there are boundaries and limitations. You will never see a door in a forest or in a desert, except there is a building there or there is a periphery, a, a, an area that is enclosed. That is when you can talk about a door. And then the, we put a door in an enclosure, one in order to prevent anybody at all from entering or to prevent somebody from going out. When the door is closed, if there is some tense within the periphery and you are outside, you can't assess what is inside. When a door is closed, probably you are inside and you are tired of that territory and you want to leave. You can't come out. 
That means you can't have another experience, another dimension of life, dimension in business. You can't enter a new dimension when the door is closed. You keep operating under a particular territory. But once the door is opened, you are liberated from a level, from an operational platform, so that you become limitless. And it takes the presence of the Lord, the move of his spirit, for you to continuously experience open doors. Just like in Psalm 24. It said, lift up your heads from the seven, O ye gaze, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. But you know what? It is possible for the doors to be opened and you are not aware. That is why being in the revival is important. It's not just enough to have doors open, but we will be aware. Like in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas prayed. The power, the presence of the Lord came down. And all the prison gates were open. Their chains were loose. And those people couldn't leave. The reason why God opened the prison gates is to liberate them. But they were so spiritually unconscious, physically unaware, that all the prisoners incidentally remained in their prison gates, the prison houses. <laughs> nobody told them stay they stayed because they were ignorant it was only Paul and Silas who remained by choice because they wanted to show whosoever put them there that they are in charge nobody said remain there remain there no it means they, they were not even aware that they have been liberated and that is how it is with some people when some people are even liberated some people desire captivity even after liberation like Israel left Egypt and on their way to the Canaan land, when they faced difficulties, they said, was it not better for us to have remained as slaves? You brought us here to die. They have so much lived in servitude, in slavery, that they chose slavery over liberty, over the promised land. Because they were spiritually unconscious and cannot even discern the difference between bondage and liberty. Even when they were still in Egypt, that Moses brought the good news of liberation, that Jehovah has sent me to liberate you, to open doors so that you can escape out of these 430 years of captivity. By the time they received it, I said, okay, let's see what is happening. All the efforts Moses made didn't work out as their expectation. Rather, Pharaoh said, okay, because you are asking for liberation, I'm going to make life more difficult for you. These fellows came to Moses and said, didn't we beg you to leave us alone? Why did you carry wahala? This preaching of liberation call, liberation mandate clause. He said, we told you, that's their words, we told you to leave us alone, let's love the Egyptians and you have come. And that is how it is with many. By the time you preach the message of liberation, how to be liberated from financial captivity. I've seen it over and again as a pastor. That many will prefer to remain poor. Prefer to remain sick. Prefer to remain on the floor. Than take responsibility to step out of captivity. Through the way of escape that Jehovah have made. Many don't take advantage of it. Because they are sleeping. There is no door that can be closed against a believer. Never. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he said he will make a way to escape so that you may be able to bear it. But you must first recognize there is a way out. Then you must recognize the way out where you see it. Because an open door does not mean much to a blind man. Even when you tell him there is an open door, if he is not guided, how will he locate the open door and walk through it? If you are in a strange house you are not conversant with and there is darkness everywhere, an open door doesn't mean much. Because if there is darkness everywhere, you, how will you locate the open door? Because until you can locate the open door, no matter how wide it is, you will remain in that territory of confinement. This day, 
God will open doors for you. Open doors simply means opportunity for advancement. Opportunity for change of story. Open door means opportunity. But you may not take charge of that opportunity or maximize that opportunity if you can't recognize the open door and what to do. For instance, God can put opportunities for wealth around you and you recognize it. So you remain in poverty. You are afraid of taking risk or afraid of making some ventures. He has put it and sometimes God will not force you through that open door. Opportunity. Even maritally, God can create opportunity for you to have peace with your spouse. But you rather not want to take it. Or you may not even see your opportunity to advance. You know, because sometimes it, we have been told, opportunities come dressed in workload. That when they look at it and say, this is work, forget it. Open door simply means opportunity. You have been here, confined here. So, this is the door open. It's an opportunity for you to live. But if you are so comfortable where you are, you will not attempt to take that opportunity. No matter what your circumstance in life is, there is hope for change. There is a promise for change. When God's servant declared that this month, I mean, this service is service of open doors, you should be excited and expectant that you are about living where you are to somewhere else. Just like he told Israelites, you have dwelt long enough in this mountain. Let's assume you are just a millionaire and you have 20 people under your employment. You should, and that has been the case for the past 10 years. You have dwelt long in this mountain. There is somewhere higher. There is next level. As I said, where there is life, there is progress. Once you are not making progress, you are dying without knowing. Dying without knowing. There must be creativity happening continuously. Every living thing, cells keep multiplying. Cells keep being created. Every living thing is constantly renewed. Made new every day. It's a new season for you. Quickly, as we try to summarize, what are the basic necessities for operating or for stepping into your open doors? Basic requirements. Number one, you must be born again for your eyes to open. The first step in enlightenment is genuine salvation. In John chapter 1, John chapter 3, verse 3, except a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom. He can see the kingdom and the kingdom gates and the kingdom doors. In chapter 3 verse 8 of the same John, he said anyone that is born of the spirit is like the wind. He is liberated. The wind cannot easily be confined like the wind. That means your destiny becomes limitless. Your operation becomes limitless. You flow easily. You are expressing your destiny Touching lies, expanding easily. And then in First John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. So there is something about genuine salvation experience. It brings you to the realms of power. It makes you a partner with Jehovah. In First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, We are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. Praise the Lord. What is the second requirement of walking through your open door? Continue to walk in the fear of the Lord. Let the fear of the Lord be your treasure. Like Joseph maintained the fear of the Lord everywhere he went. In every circumstance. He kept saying, I fear God. I fear God. I fear God. That means reference for God reference for anything that has a touch of Jehovah. And it takes devotion to do that. Once you are devoted to God, you are addicted to God. Worshipping God is not all about attending church service. Worshipping God has to do with emotional attachment to Jehovah. Worship. 
devotion. Hallowing God. Worship and reverence are very close. You reverence God. And once you reverence God, you see him everywhere. Praise God. Like I said in one service, I said, when I see a Sangoma, I see God at work. Hello? Some people see devil at work. I see God at work. If his heart is beating, it is God. If his lungs is working, it is God. If his hand is moving, it is God. It will only take God for the organs of the body to work. The devil doesn't have that wisdom. <laughs> I see God at work. I see the creation of God. The handwork of God. What his lifestyle is all about is another thing entirely. But looking at him, I see the wonders of God. See, great. In fact, there is no miracle greater than creation. Healing is, healing is just maintenance. Oh, it's, it's, it's more difficult to design a car than to repair a car. You know, when blind eyes open, people shout. But when I look at you, I see a bigger miracle than blind eyes opening. When I see a Sangoma, I see a bigger miracle than cripple walking. Every human being is a miracle. In fact, miracle is happening in your life every day. You know, can I tell you one miracle? When you eat food, a lot of things happen, and that food end becomes this leaf. Yeah? You eat cucumber. Cucumber becomes flesh. The flesh you have now is all manner of maize, cucumber, cassava, all kinds of things you ate. That's transformation. If you know what is happening in every human body every day, you, you reverence God. You hallow God. Spiritual people see more of God than the devil. Because they understand that God is omnipresent, the devil is not omnipresent. Cannot people see devil everywhere? Can I people, you have a blue weave on, you're a devil. Your fingers reach that word there, you're a devil. You didn't pay them their salary on time, you're a devil. <laughs> For them, the devil is omnipresent. <laughs> For any wrongdoing on earth, devil. They, they don't even blame man. Everything, anything that goes wrong on earth, devil. As if to say somebody can't do something wrong even without the devil. They magnify the devil so much. I tell people, okay, if you said there must be a tempter for somebody to do wrong, who tempted the devil for him to sin? He sinned without a tempter. So it is possible to sin without a tempter. He rebelled in heaven without anybody pushing him to rebel. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Most often, what people don't understand that is not profitable to them is evil. If, as long as I don't understand it, and from my understanding, little understanding is not bringing me blessed, oh, it must be evil. <laughs> so they see evil everywhere. May the Lord liberate you from this. Yeah. That when you look around, you can easily worship God. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy part throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul. <laughs> how great, how great then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great. Praise the Lord. To experience open doors, you have to remain in love with God. Romans 8.28, we know by experience. That all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And it's impossible to love God without loving his work. One way we manifest our love for God is to love his creation, to love his works, his works. And the apex of his works is human beings. 
That is why the Bible said, how can you claim to love God when you don't express love for the human being around you? Praise the Lord. And one main thing we do, one of the greatest of blessings you can give to a human being is to help him find the way of salvation. To help him find the light. Then to help him fulfill destiny. His purpose, his calling on earth. Number four, in order to enjoy constant open doors, we must be committed to following God's leadings. Committed to following God's leadings. Don't just do anything, anyhow, anytime. Be patient. Be still. And know that I'm God. In Psalm 24, it said, The Lord is my shepherd. I sh Psalm 23, I shall not want. Praise God. Because he will lead you to green pastures. He will lead you to still waters. Even when you are passing through turbulent times, you are sure of his leading. So you can say, even that walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are certain that you are coming to a place where he has prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. You are sure your cup will overflow. You are sure of goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Simply because you have made the Lord your shepherd. That means you have accepted his role as a shepherd to lead you to treasures of darkness. He said, and they tested not when he led them. Because even when there's no water, he made water to come out from the rock. And finally, enter into a covenant to serve God and the interests of his kingdom as a lifestyle. Give yourself to God, to the worship of Jehovah, to his service. Like I said before, life is not all about acquiring possessions. Possessions are necessary. I'm not saying they are not. Everything, every, most of the tools man have created have been so helpful. But they must be put where they belong. They are temporal. They are material. They are not a sure source of joy and happiness. They can help you to become happy truly. But where other factors are not there, they will never bring joy, happiness, fulfillment and satisfaction. But there is nobody who is a genuine steward of God, servant of God, dedicated to serving God, who will not have a smooth, glorious, joyful ride on earth and be blessed in all things. Like in Genesis 24, the Bible said, and the Lord has blessed Abraham in all things. Just make a covenant, personal covenant. I will serve this God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Like Paul said, what can separate me from the love of God? I, as a human being in this, my short life, I have seen amazing things that I'm not sure there's any human being on earth who can stop me from my devotion to God. I have seen things in my life I've seen things in the life of church members. I've seen things in the life even of unbelievers. I've seen things. And I can tell you with 100% assurance, he pays to serve Jesus. I speak from my heart. He will always be with you if we do our part. There is nothing this wide world can pleasure for. I'll be a true soldier. I'll die at my post. I'll love him far better than in days of old. I'll serve him more truly than ever before. I'll do as he beats me, whatever the cost. I'll be a true soldier. I'll die at my post. Rise to your feet. <laughs> Glory to God. Is your seasons of Glory. Before we pray this morning, it's important that someone surrenders his life to Christ. It's very important. You have to surrender. He can take care of you like the choir sang. I'm too sure of that. He can take care of you. He said, come, I will give you rest. You are here this morning. You want to give your life to Christ. Please, can you step out of your seat and come forward to the altar? Jesus is waiting for you here. Wherever you are, come forward quickly. Jesus is calling you. Come, come, come. Every woman, every man, come. 
The Holy Ghost is touching you. Come, 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 come. Don't stay where you are. This is your season of glory. You have to leave your past life behind. Make your decision this morning. Make your decision this morning. Wherever you are, step forward, step forward. You don't need to be ashamed. Step forward. I've got my mind made up in the woods on that Cause I want to see my Jesus someday the Lord.